I request everybody to be seated so that we can proceed with the event. So welcome you all for the event titled Direct to Device with advancements in technology direct to handset satellite communication is going to become more affordable and accessible, making it an increasingly popular solution for reliable communication in challenging environments. A discussion with the enablers. The event will be chaired by Mr. H. Rayapa, Director, SATCOM PO ISRO Headquarters. Please, sir, I would like to welcome you on the stage, Mr. H. Rayapa. Our moderator would be Mr. Jeremy Rose, partner, Comsys UK. Please, sir. And I would like to invite the speakers for the event, Mr. Vivek Kimbahon, Executive Vice President, Sanakya Labs. Very welcome, sir. Can we have a good round of applause for them? <laughs> Another speaker would be Mr. Satya Narayan Swami, Vice President, India, Vice Sat. Mr. Alexander Jovic, ICT and Space Tech Professional. I please hand over the chair to the chair, Ms. H. Arapa. Please proceed with the event, sir. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, after lunch, uh, we are reassembling for a session. Hopefully, uh, we'll try to keep it uh, <laughs> light and warm so that we can get into active discussions. So our session, uh, uh, we have one hour, 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, what we have planned is uh, first uh, a few minutes, uh, uh, we have the panel of speakers uh, from uh, distinct areas, uh, starting from satellite and operations uh, uh, from Uyasat, Mr. Satya and uh, Mr. Vivek uh, from a technology company who are into making the devices, particularly the handheld and uh, portable devices. Uh, we have Mr. Alexander Zook, uh, he's uh, from a space, he's a space tech professional. So we have uh, people from uh, w w different backgrounds and with lots of experience and uh, uh, most apt panel to discuss the subject uh, direct to device. Uh, so, what we'll do is I have a few slides just to give some thoughts and mostly our discussion will be on the same uh, lines and we will have each speaker sharing uh, their ideas through their PPTs and uh, may maybe about 20-25 uh, minutes or uh, some 30 minutes. Uh, uh, no, I think each one of us can spend about 10 minutes, some 35 to 40 minutes. Remaining 40 minutes probably we can get into discussions. I hope all the audience will uh, get into an active discussions in this area. Thank you. Can I open my PPT? So direct to device uh, Direct, uh, hope audible. Yeah, direct to device is uh, uh, a new area which has a lot of uh, attractions and a lot of discussions are happening there. And it's also one of the most uh, uh, sort of term, uh, technological change, I should say, which will uh, find solution to many of the digital divide gaps which uh, uh, we are facing everywhere irrespective of the uh, geographical region or uh, uh, whatever economic region or uh, whatever reason. So there are divides which, which is expected to be one of the solution which can address to f bridge these kind of gaps. Uh, it is uh, 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 will make it as a platform to use the standards uh, uh, smartphones and IoT devices seamlessly connect to the base stations of the cellular uh, mobile connectivities and also when the coverage is not there seamlessly to, to switch to the satellite to continue the 
connectivity. And as per uh, one of the studies by GSMA Intelligence Enterprise uh, way back in 2021, it is estimated that uh, 570 million people, that is about 8.7% of the adult population, uh, those who are living out of the network coverage are in the edge of the coverage and need uh, to have the uh, internet connectivity using uh, this kind of technology. In addition to uh, having the broadband and cellular connectivity, the IoT and M2EM is another area which uh, 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 finds as a niche area uh, to make use of this platform. Uh, the, again, uh, here, uh, when you talk about the satellite communication, uh, it, it, it's a realization we have to believe that there will not be any dish or uh, even when you go out of the non-coverage area, you will not have even a base station so that your, our device will be able to seamlessly connect to the satellites which will be dynamically moving at the low earth orbiting orbits, uh, which will enable or which will also enable the connectivity and also for the operators it will benefit in the form of uh, optimized costs, reducing the operational costs and also enhancing the efficiencies. And it's also estimated that by 2035, this sector is going to reach to about 30 billion uh, American dollars. Uh, already we saw that the 5G non-terrestrial network has provided the foundation for this. Uh, of course, uh, there are technological challenge of re realizing the uh, chipsets uh, which has embraced the new radio uh, to communicate to the satellite. And also there are technological challenges of uh, dealing with uh, Doppler shifts and uh, seamless switching from satellite to satellite and connecting to backhand and having a different gateways and uh, operations uh, cutting across the various uh, boundaries, national boundaries, etc. And also spectrum usage, whether to use the IMT bandwidth or the MSS satellite bandwidth or both or a new one, that's a kind of a question uh, which has to be uh, uh, dealt with. Again, uh, looking at the future, who will lead or who has to lead, whether the IMT, uh, the terrestrial mobile industry which are into that will lead this uh, uh, sector or the LEO satellite segment operators who will lead the industry? That's again another question we need to uh, uh, look into that. Perhaps these are the discussion points we have to take it forward. Uh, added to that, the AST uh, space mobile, uh, the testing which they recently did in the month of uh, April, which is a major milestone. It has given a lot of hopes that uh, so direct -to device is going to be a game changer a most uh, aspirational technology which will help both uh, society, economy uh, and uh, even uh, 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 the cultural, uh, to bridge the cultural gaps. Uh, with this, uh, I, I'll go back to the speakers to throw light on these things. Now I request uh, Mr. Vivek uh, Kimbahune, Executive Vice President, Sankhya Labs, Bangalore. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, all. Uh, thank you, Chair, for that uh, very crisp and uh, very apt introduction uh, about today's uh, discussion that we are going to have. My name is uh, Vivek Kimbahone. I am from Sankhya Labs. Uh, we are India's uh, premier semiconductor wireless and system solutions company. Uh, my today's presentation covers uh, basically three aspects. Uh, as a company, what we have been doing. Uh, and also the solutions that we bring to the market in terms of the applications that are already on uh, working on the field. And then in addition to that, also uh, my take on the overall direct-to-device. Uh, direct so 
we were india's first fabless semiconductor company uh, we started in 2007 uh, predominantly as a fabless semiconductor company so in the first 4 5 years of our existence we were like a typical qualcom or broadcom just focusing uh, essentially on just the chipset part of the business but over a period of last 8 to 10 years we have evolved from being a chipset company to a system solutions provider and uh, our uh, foray today is basically in the 5g oran space we are on the infra side of the 5g oran space we are building the radios uh, basically for uh, for the uh, telcos uh, based on the uh, 5g nr then we also have a very active uh, business in in satcom thanks to isro uh, we have been isro's partner technology partner for about 10 years now and uh, we have uh, you know uh, together worked on quite a few solutions which i'll talk about and then there is a new broadcast standard in the world today called etsc 3.0 uh, which is essentially uh, being adopted in united states as well as south korea but there are a lot of uh, countries which uh, are are now trialing out etsc 3.0 as a broadcast standard uh, and as we speak these trials are also going on in india and we were uh, one of the first companies in india to have a 5G trial license uh, for the 5G broadcast so i'll cover that also a little bit so our journey has been very 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 engaging i would say uh, because being being the first in the business in terms of uh, you know india has this perception of we are very good at uh, services business but not really on the product space and more so on the on the chipset side when i say we are the first fabless semiconductor company i don't say it with too much of pride you know we have been into technology space for so long but uh, you know we started the chipset in 2007 so that that is something which uh, you know we uh, long a lot of lot many companies are coming along so i think that's a good sign but yeah there is still lot needs to be done on the chipset space so being a technology company like uh, riper sir said that basically one of the critical yardsticks for any technology company is uh, the number of technology patents that you hold we are about 70 plus international patents uh, on the chipset as well as the system solution space uh, we are a mid size company about 200 plus and recently we were acquired by the tata group so we are now part of the tejas networks so our, our journey of last about 15 16 years we have uh, you know benefited from uh, the innovative quotient of the group and uh, we have had uh, quite a few awards in uh, in excellence in innovation the uh, recently for the 2023 the economic times awarded as uh, awarded us with the excellence in uh, excellence in innovation award and also just about two weeks back the atc 3.0 which was predominantly an american driven organization uh they they uh, you know awarded the richard medal for exemplary contribution to an american standard and of course uh, the claim to fame has been the chipset but uh, like i said we have evolved from being a chipset to system solutions company now at a very very top level some of the solutions which are already uh, field deployed are basically in three category uh, you know uh, strategic areas uh, one is in in the field of coastal security uh, i'll talk about this this is basically a vessel tracking network for uh, tracking of uh, deep sea fishing vessels as well as for fishermen safety uh, we also built the satellite phone Uh, now that is one interesting area which is which is going to be the focus of today's discussion so this is again working on an s band and uh, as we all know the satellite phones that exist in the world today operate on l band so uh, incidentally this is this is industry's first s band uh, satellite phone uh again developed in partnership with isro and uh, the other important project of national importance we did was basically uh, to deploy our satcom terminals uh, on on uh, the indian trains not exactly the trains but basically electro locomotives so this network also has been operational so since the today's topic is basically on the uh, on direct to device so we we uh, were in touch with uh, isro for one of the strategic uh, satellites that they had which which was an s band satellite now this was a mss satellite and we uh, basically worked with them to bring to market a first of its kind satellite uh, phone now this is an interesting piece of a device it basically is a modem which which kind of a companion device for your android phone so your any android phone can be converted into a satellite phone so it pairs to the android phone on a bluetooth or a wifi device 
uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi and also a physical interface via the USB and then basically your existing phone itself via secure app can become a satellite phone. So this was done much 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 before Apple made it uh, you know to the market. So this was we had delivered way back in 2019. Uh, four years before uh, Apple did and today the Apple phone only supports the SOS and, and uh, emergency messaging but this phone supports voice, uh, short messaging service and also narrow band data communication. So this was much ahead of its time uh, but uh, since the satellite was meant only for defense and strategic applications so there is a limited uh, market for this one but the same concept we could adopt it for commercial satellites as well. Now. The interesting part of this phone was everything had to be developed ground up because like I said there all the satellite phones that exist in the world today are L-band so we ended up you know designing the antennas, the diplexers, the whole circuitry and uh, the, the best part about this phone is that it is powered by our own chipsets. These are soft, software defined radio chipsets, very very low power. So from the concept to uh, production all has been done in India, in India including the uh, SDR chipsets. Now, we have kind of evolved from being, being uh, you know, as a, as a companion device or a augmentation device uh, to having the chipset on board. So today, you know, it, it's a matter of pride for all of us that uh, we are the only company in the world today to have an ATSC 3.0 enabled smartphone reference design. There are four companies in the world which have demonstrated an ATSC 3.0 uh, demodulator chipset. There is Sony, there is Samsung, there is LG and there is Sankhya. Uh, but all of them have focused on, on predominantly the linear televisions but we are the first company in the world to have a reference design. So this is an interesting piece because uh, it, it augurs well for the uh, discussion that we are having today because this chip is now al already on a 4G smartphone uh, where it enables a different kind of a convergence. Uh, basically today if you see uh, although we are talking about satellite as a convergence but GPS has been in the phones for more than 20, 20 years now. So in one way the satellite had already penetrated the mobile phone but it was only receive only. Now today what we are talking about is, is basically both transmit as well as receive. Now similarly the, the broadcast has, has not been into the phone uh, primarily for a lot of business reasons and other but uh, this will enable a completely different, uh, uh, you know, uh, different market space wherein you can have these phones actually uh, receive high, meaning 5G content, basically 5G broadcast content because you can have a high throughput into your phone without having to pay for the, uh, for the internet. So that's the beauty of this one. Now there are plethora of uses here, you can use it for edutainment, infotainment, video offload and all of those. So this essentially kind of becomes a true convergence of a broadband and a broadcast phone. Now you add the SATCOM element to that then it's, it's, uh, it's like the holy grail of basically broadcast, broadband and SATCOM. Now the other project like I just mentioned uh, uh, earlier, the project of national importance is basically the uh, vessel tracking uh, network which is for coastal security and also fishermen safety. So currently we are deploying a network on uh, on deep sea fishing vessels. As we speak, there are uh, you know already thousand plus boats which are equipped with our SATCOM modems. So essentially, this is also a connected device in the sense that it's uh, it's like a satellite hotspot for the fishermen out there deep in the sea. Uh, basically, he just uses his Android phone, connects to this uh, device. As you can see here, there is a there is a terminal which gets mounted on top and uh, there is an indoor device which is an audio visual alarm for emergency messaging as well as SOS and he can just use his regular Android feature phone, uh, Android smartphone and connect to this device and do two-way messaging. In addition to that, he gets weather alerts, he gets uh, SOS messaging and all of this. So it's, it's sort of a intermediate step between having a fully connected device to an uh, enabling device. So in addition to you know, deploying this on the on the deep sea fishing vessels, we have also set up a command and control center. All this again in partnership with uh, uh, ISRO, uh, where we have a complete 
a, a command and control center for tracking all the fishing vessels and also it has a lot of uh, facilities in terms of the uh, platform the user nms platform that is developed that's again developed ground up uh, in partnership with the department of fisheries it it enables you to track it enables to monitor you can do control surveillance uh, it also enables to send data to the fishermen weather information and during emergencies he also has an uh, ability to press a sos button to seek and help and uh, he can do this is a you know multilingual application so he can message sitting in his boat to the to the shore both to his boat owner as well as to uh, you know the department and also it enables the department itself to kind of digitize all its records uh, and there are a lot of subsidies and all and also sometimes there are a lot you know ecologically uh, fragile zones where you where you shouldn't uh, be fishing so this enables you to monitor those as well this is a multilingual app we have multiple variants of the app one for the department officials which has higher privileges then there is a separate app for the fishermen uh, itself wherein they can communicate uh, you know in their own local lingo and also there is a, a specific app for the for the boat owner as well these are some of the snapshots so this get mounted on top of the boat and the idu that is the audio visual alarm device is fitted inside so as he approaches the international maritime maritime boundary he gets a uh, alert so a lot of lives are left unfortunately the fishermen you know get into foreign territories and get shot get caught and all so this could potentially avoid that and in cases of distress they can basically seek help via the sos and they also get advance information in terms of the uh, cyclones and all likewise we have also deployed our our uh, terminals on on the indian railways so indian railways wanted to have a real time tracking uh, uh, network for all the all their assets now one of the challenges that they had were the the cellular connectivity all along the length and breadth of the country is not not uniform so they wanted to augment it with mss so we uh, in partnership with isro and also bharat electronics we supplied the hub base band this is again based on our own chipsets and uh, we also supplied the modems this is also again based on our own chipsets so it's an end to end indigenous solution from the satellite to the bandwidth to the terminals to the hub base band equipment everything ground up and this network has been operational for 4 years so in summary basically sankhya labs has has evolved from being a typical chipset provider to a complete system solution provider we have designed and deployed terminals we have supplied hub base band equipment for live networks uh, we have completely ground up build the user nms platforms uh, we have built multilingual applications for android uh, linux and uh, windows environments and we also have the expertise of uh, now you know deploying uh, these networks and and maintaining these networks in addition to that our forte has been the chipset so today a lot of focus is on the low power uh, highly programmable chipset so uh, that's that's been our dna of the organization so we would continue to do uh, specific chipsets for satellite applications and uh, then with this unique expertise i think we sh we will be able to add a lot of value to the satellite operators and also service providers globally now this is my last slide and uh, basically if you see the direct to uh, mobile Uh, satellite to mobile service specifically if you were to look at it now let's leave the other part of the uh, the iot part of it but if you were to just look at specifically as a as a sat phone is an application uh, today we are looking at sat phone for sos and emergency messaging you are using sat phone for maybe uh, voice and text messaging and going forward with the bandwidth permitting and uh, also the the hardware permitting you could potentially have some narrow band uh, data and internet narrow band data when i say suppose if you just want to send audio file or uh, image or something you could be able to do that and also you should be able to do the internet like we used to do in the gprs environment in the 2.5g 3g kind of uh, stuff so we should be able to do that on the devices now the challenges however are today if you see the on the devices part of it uh the devices today there are some dedicated satellite phones from uh inmarsat turaya iridium and all of those so those are specifically meant for satellite phone service where they support voice they support uh, you know short messaging but and also the, you can potentially use them for sos as well but the narrow band data and internet is something which is not happening on those devices yet 
Now that is one way of looking at it. The second one is basically companion device that I just spoke about that you can have some kind of a accessory which is like a satellite hotspot which kind of bridges that gap between your uh, existing phone uh, so that it kind of is completely agnostic to whether you are using an Android phone or an Apple phone. So you can communicate with this device. So that's a companion device. The third one is where currently, like if you see, uh, Apple went and modified their hardware to support the, uh, you know, sat phone service. So that is some kind of a smartphone with a modified hardware. And then eventually the holy grail in this network is basically to have a single phone which uh, seamlessly talks to the telecom network as well as the uh, satellite network but that is still uh, you know some distance away so that is on the device ecosystem part of it the chipset per se are now like I said I showcased you that the chipsets are already uh, there on the platform those could be done however the antennas and all the power consumption battery those kind of challenges we need to uh, look for the second one is I think the space assets now a lot of companies are, are uh, coming up with uh, different constellations the Leo, Mio, Geo. So like he, he mentioned in the presentation the the basically the each of these come up with a different kind of set of challenges uh, you know if you talk about Leo there will be a huge Doppler which you need to factor in for and uh, device this similarly Mio and Geo also come with some own pluses and minuses. The other one is a unified service, which is basically what all the Immersat iridiums of the world today are doing, where they say, I have a satellite, I have a uh, feature meaning smartphone, and we do that. And then there is basically interoperable satellites, which uh, I think that likes of the, what he mentioned about the AST and Link and all. What they are essentially saying is, I'll keep your hardware the same, the same mobile phone that you use for communicating over the terrestrial network. I will build a corresponding uh, uh, net satellite network without having to change your hardware i can i can talk to the uh, to the uh, satellite so that's the interoperable satellite now there are obviously business new business models that are evolving uh, you have standalone service which all these guys do there are augmented service wherein they tie up with an mno Mr. and Vic, deliver this if you can quickly conclude sorry i'm yeah. last slide yeah two. and then the convert service basically where you have everything integrated maybe tomorrow a operator might do that one the uh, the other part is basically regulatory uh, you know as we all know uh, satellite is a very very regulated environment and we need to uh, look at how the overall things uh, evolve. So in the interest of time, I'll just stop here. Uh, appreciate your time. If you have any questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vivek. Uh, may I now request Mr. Satya Narayan Swami, Vice President uh, India, Viasat. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to uh, SIA uh, for organizing this excellent uh, India Space Congress. Um, hello also to our esteemed chair, uh, Raipa sir, and my fellow participants, Mr. Vivek and Mr. Alexander. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for being here also and for the time. So what I wanted to talk about was spend a few minutes introducing Viasat and also provide our perspective on this entire area of direct device. Uh, and to remind everyone that direct device has been existing for a long time. We keep changing the definition of it uh, and we'll talk about it, right? But it's become a hot new space, so that is worth talking about. Uh, essentially, from a Viasat perspective, we are a global satellite-based service provider. We provide satellite-based service. We operate our own satellites. We provide satellite-based service all over the world. Um, and many of you might have heard of the fact that we just launched our terabit per second uh, satellite about two months ago. Uh, this is currently over the Americas, followed by launches in Europe and Asia Pacific, and these are the largest uh, communication satellites in the world right now. Okay. So besides that innovation, which brings a lot of high throughput capacity, right? It brings a lot of not narrow band, but real broadband to a lot of places, whether it's on Earth, whether it's on planes, whether it's on the ship, etc. Um, 
What we've also done is recently we have acquired Inmarsat, which Vivek mentioned a couple of times. Uh, Inmarsat is a large global operator and combined between us, we are operating a fleet across the L band, which is right in the middle of the spectrum that is usable for these types of direct to device uh, connections but also in KA band. So we bring both the, the narrow band and the broadband connection and are one of the largest uh, satellite based service providers uh, with over 4 billion in revenues. Okay. So um, if you look at the markets we're in, I mentioned we have broadband services where we provide service at homes. So we have an antenna like Tata Sky antenna or DTH antenna and you can get broadband up to 150 megabits at home using satellite or we are also on planes. We are on many thousand airplanes worldwide providing service uh, and really fast service, not just text messaging, etc. There are, I have ridden on planes where there are people streaming Netflix on the plane, right? Um, and you can do that. Oh, even better, I've, you know, I've even streamed live sports, which turns out to be a killer app when it comes to the time when you're on a plane because a lot of people finish their day and they start flying at like 6 p.m. And by the time they land, the IPL game is half over. They don't have to do that anymore, right? You can watch it on the plane. This is, this is truly interesting to see how many people watch live sports. Um, and of course, government services. You know, we talked about safety services, like Vivek mentioned, amazing application with fisheries, right? Like that, there are lots of government services uh, uh, where we support, um, you know, satellite-based broadband and connectivity, right? So, but before we go to... Um, the, the huge focus on D2D, right, uh, direct to device, is really that the combination of broadband and IoT is really the powerful one, right? Depending on which study you read, I'm sure there are 10 studies which rate everything from 50 billion to 500 billion. Mr. Ayapa's study said 35 billion. My study says 445 billion, right? It doesn't matter. There's a lot of money in this, right? Because there's a lot of value to be added, right? We saw fisheries, agriculture, which everybody talks about, food transportation, right? Uh, lots and lots of tracking and monitoring, right? Besides that control, today we talk about monitoring the train, tomorrow we could control the train, right? And also what is happening is we are seeing this transformation in many industries with analytics. We are going into places like oil rigs, chemical plants, mines, where people used to use satellite only to send a little bit of data because it was so expensive. Now they don't, they're changing their process. They're saying, look, I'm gonna take, send as much data as I want over satellite, I'm gonna send it to the cloud and I'm gonna analyze it, I'm gonna make real time decisions. So it's really creating a lot of value in a lot of industries. And that's the application here, where you're taking all these remote industries and then connecting them to cloud and you get the analytics. So it's very fast, it's evolving, um, you know, we talk about security, we talk about land mobility, all of these applications are evolving. So tracking, analytics, and of course, control are different systems, right? So that's the excitement, and the question is how do we realize all this value? But before we go there, I did want to remind people that direct-to-device has existed for a long time, right? Uh, just in India, we have, in partnership with BSNL through our acquisition of NMARSAT, over 8,000, uh, many thousand of these uh, satellite phones. Right? that are being used by defense forces and also people who, can, uh, who want to be able to be connected outside the terrestrial network. Right? So, so why is there new excitement about direct device? It's really that the paradigm is changing. Right? Like Vivek talked about, these are dedicated devices meant for satellites and they've existed, they're fantastic. But what we want to move on to is devices that can work both on the terrestrial network and the satellite network. So that's the attraction. Right? That's the, that's the key thing, right? And why that's being enabled is that if you look at the spectrum in which satellite operates, in the L band and the S band, etc., these are easily integrated from a technology perspective, right? They're right alongside these terrestrial frequencies and with the right amount of technology and waveforms, the frequency doesn't become a challenge, but you do need to do some modifications in order for it to work, but they're working. Right? So that's the excitement on director device, that I can have one phone, one device that can work on both networks. So there, there are multiple approaches being taken. Right? right now, there's a lot of investment going in. There are operators who are saying, oh, I'm going to 
you know, set up satellites which are going to talk directly on mobile spectrum, directly to phones on the ground, there's nothing required, right? Our approach is very different, right? Because that has issues that need to be discussed before we rush to put, you know, cell towers in the sky, so to speak, because that could have interference problems, national boundary issues, also mobile networks are operating on those frequencies. What we are talking about is using licensed satellite spectrum, which is in the L-band, which we have a lot of uh, across the world, S-band in some cases, um, where we want to be able to use this licensed spectrum and operate satellite over it. And that's what we are talking about from a direct-to-device perspective. We think it's a bit too early to suddenly start saying, okay, everything is going to work, we're just going to move all our cell towers into the sky, we don't need anything on the ground. I think that's unrealistic because the amount of bandwidth that can be provided from a satellite also has limitations in terms of it's hard to compete with the bandwidth economics and also the capacity on the terrestrial network. But it has to be complementary. It is not satellite operator versus mobile operator in this case. It's really an ecosystem, right? So that's the important thing. So um, with that, I also wanted to point out that we are working to build this ecosystem. The ecosystem is not just, like I said, satellite operator, mobile operator. We need chipset vendors. We need phone manufacturers, right? All of these really need to combine to provide this. We have joined forces. We are collaborating with chipset vendors. For example, we recently did a demo with uh, MediaTek using our uh, L-band network where we are able to provide uh, connectivity. And just to remind you, a lot of people think 5G NTN is a LEO phenomenon. Let me remind you, it is not. It doesn't require LEO only. This is from GEO. Okay, not the Reliance GEO, the GEO satellite. <laughs> Um, so, geosynchronous satellites, middle, uh, you know, ME, MEO satellites, LEO satellites, all of them are capable of operating on this, and each of them brings different characteristics. But this particular demo is really based on geosynchronous satellites, right? Geostationary. So. Similarly, we've partnered with others, uh, again, on the L-band spectrum, with Legado, Skylo, which builds, you know, the, the infrastructure required to connect all these devices using MSS spectrum, right? And I think the, the key message that I'm trying to convey is this is not about one person going out there and saying, okay, I'm going to establish this and we're going to make this run. I think this requires an ecosystem where a lot of technologies and operators have to come together. And that's what we're trying to increase in terms of collaboration. But the last thing I want to say is besides building the ecosystem, one of the things we want to do is build the ecosystem sustainably, right? We hear a lot of talk about ESG, right? Environmental, social governance practices, we should be careful what are we doing to the environment. Today, we are seeing a, a rush to build mega constellations, right? Orbits are being filled and countries, including India today, which does not have a LEO solution, could get blocked out, right? Because if you look at it, uh, there are a couple of US operators. China has launching their own 30,000 satellite LEO system. Where does that leave room even for a large country like India? This is something to be considered. Now, also on the other side is that you uh, have issues in terms of increasing collision risk. If you get a chance, go to your phones and you can look at this company called Leo Labs. Okay, they have a demo. You can open it up and say, how many objects are above my head in Delhi? I should have opened it here. You'll be astounded how many objects are above, head, above our heads right now at 400 to 800 kilometers. We are starting to fill these things up fast and this is becoming a problem. So that is one part of it. The second is, of course, you know, it limits astronomy, right? Um, so I talked about this Blue Walker uh, AST mobile. Okay, let me give you a data point. This is interesting, okay? This Blue Walker satellite, the first one that was built, is one of the top 20 brightest objects in the sky. And this is a sky with thousands of stars, which we haven't seen for a long time in Delhi, but you have to go out to see it. But once you go out, you'll see thousands, right? And it's the 20th, it's within the top 20. So imagine what we are doing to astronomy, right? We were navigating by stars. Now we'll have to navigate by saying, okay, oh, Starlink 4000 is over here. You know, Blue Walker 3 is over here. Let's go this way. It's hard, right? So we have to be thoughtful about what we are doing to other areas when it comes to these mega constellations. So we are trying to build this ecosystem sustainably. So with that, I'll leave you the fact that it's important. We believe in connecting people. We talked about connectivity but also important that we have a sustainable approach to it. 
um, and hopefully we'll have a good discussion in terms of how we unlock opportunity for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Satya. May I now invite Mr. Alexander Zhu. Uh, he's an ICT and a space tech professional. Dear Chairman, dear Chairman, dear fellow panelists, yes, uh, no, 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 sorry, no, yes. okay, thank you, <laughs> so I start again, dear Chairman, dear fellow panelists, Dear delegates, dear visitors, thank you, Sia, for allowing me to speak to you. Um, I have the opportunity, not as a vendor, but as someone who is in this industry since a long time and uh, also supporting various projects, um, but also looking for a, from a consultancy, from an advisory point into the whole thing. And uh, we also see us as an enabler because we are helping to understand what's happening in the ecosystem. And uh, yes, um, there are a lot of changes and there are maybe, is it a game changer? It's there since a long time, so did we miss something? I will go into that, but first I want to give you also a short introduction again who we are, what we are doing. So Space Tech Partners is in principle a management consultancy company focusing on the space sector, where we are doing in principle um, various uh, practices on strategy, innovation, which is an important thing, and market development. We are having hubs uh, of people in Brussels, in Munich, uh, in the UK as well, but we are operating globally and uh, also involved in global projects. One of the focus of the company is the engagement with European institutions. Uh, like you mentioned also, there are many constellations uh, in place already. There are more coming, but uh, potentially some countries, some regions feel to be left out, so there are considerations. So for example, in Europe, there's also the consideration to build a complementing, let's call it, constellation, and maybe India will go for that. Uh, but uh, I think uh, what is remarkable now is to mention this S-Band terminal, because I, 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 I was engaged in some discussions years ago with, with Andrix and Isro at that time, and uh, uh, well done, yeah. Uh, it shows in principle that if we are talking about commodity D2D, it doesn't mean it's all the same. Yeah? We are having still the need for private networks also. And I think, for example, S-Band could be a very good example for building private networks in the D2D domain. Um, myself, I was working in the past for companies like Airbus, like SES, like ST Engineering, uh, involved in VSAT projects in India already in the 90s, but uh, yeah, there's an evolution going on uh, in, in the whole satellite communication domain. Uh, it starts at the ground segment, but also on LEO, GEO, MIO, we don't want to forget, yeah? MIO is the perfect place, per, for example, even not only for low latency, but also for constellations that could be building a relay between LEO and MIO and then to the ground again. Because we always have to see that the LEO constellations, if you want to have real-time traffic, you need to launch thousands of satellites, or hundreds at least. And until this is not complete, there's no real-time traffic. This has, of course, also an impact then on the D2D prospect. Um, oops, sorry. I want to mention that also with Space Tech Partners, there's uh, already since 2013 
quite some engagement in India uh, where the focus had been mainly on the navigation and positioning, uh, running various uh, workshops uh, together with ISRO and also uh, uh, with the European Space Agency. Um, but uh, yeah, we are, we are seeing that uh, India with the established space agency, but also the uh, market potential uh, uh, and the potential of engineering capability is playing an important role in the future of uh, developing the D2D business as well. Uh, here you see some pictures from the uh, former events we were running here in India. Uh, now direct to device. So uh, some people say it had been already here. Some people say, okay, it's this, it's that. What does it mean? Okay, if you see different reports, it may mean different things, but important is at the end, uh, D2D is to integrate satellite with terrestrial mobile networks, yeah? And uh, that is, I think, what is at the moment uh, the main discussion, that suddenly we will bring in in the whole discussion the mobile network operators. We don't bring them in only for backhauling discussions. We don't bring them in for critical infrastructure IoT discussion. No, now the idea is really to provide a seamless connectivity even in areas that are not reachable by the normal rollout. However, there's still a way to go because so far there's no voice message, uh, there's messaging, uh, but that's it, yeah? We will have to see when we will get to voice uh, uh, on D2D with the mobile operators. Um, and then also, if we have to go for high data rates, uh, maybe the L band and S band, uh, uh, and even today spectrum is, is limited already, and we have to think about higher spectrum uh, in the millimeter wave domain. Uh, that's something we will have to see. Um, the main thing what is now changing also the whole situation is in principle the 3G PPP integration. Yeah. With the release 17, there is now really, uh, 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 um, yeah, uh, we are trying to, to, to have for the first time in principle the satellite part of the mobile network. But that is one side. On the other side, it is still to utilize uh, the MSS world as good as possible. And uh, I think both will stay there as well, at least for a while. Now, again, uh, the number about what we are talking, what's the market. Um, so I'm coming up here with a 66.8 billion, uh, which is out of an NSR report. Uh, I, I think it's important to see that uh, people believe there's a huge potential. Same time, I want to tell you also, there are also people saying, oh, it may take much longer and this is maybe only the next gimmick and features we need on an iPhone because who is buying a next iPhone if there's not a new feature? <laughs> so, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, here, I think that is an interesting uh, uh, slice because here you see in principle what is needed. Yeah, we have the chipset and the base band and of course we would have to add here the Indian company as well. Uh, we're having the various OEMs, we're having the satellite industry, and we're having the telcos. And coming out of the VSAT world, where it was a rather simple world, we have a satellite operator, we have a, a, a VSAT service provider. Here you are bringing together uh, major, major players uh, and a huge ecosystem. And uh, there's a lot of money involved and a lot of power game. So we will see where this is all going. And that's why we as a consultancy company and as an advisor also having a look on that because uh, there can be a lot of changes happening. Now, uh, the generic SATCOM challenges and D2D specific questions remain, of course, yeah? And uh, the main thing as mentioned is the access to the spectrum, but specific is also the regulatory point and the network partner point. All the rest stays more or less the same like we had before. 
Uh, also important to understand, if we are talking about TD to D, the spectrum, in principle, we have in the satellite spectrum. This is the MSS, L-band or S-band, or what we will see in the future. Uh, there may be even some unlicensed uh, terrestrial spectrum. Uh, on the E-band, there's some opportunity, uh, I think, as well. And then, of course, there's the licensed mobile spectrum. And this is, again, in principle, Apple, um, Huawei, uh, um, and others. They are trying to utilize that license spectrum provided by the uh, 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 satellite operators, in principle, and uh, others uh, like Link or uh, others, they, they, they try to utilize the licensed mobile spectrum of the mobile operators. Uh, uh, however, this also has a certain impact on uh, where do I place the gateway, how do I hand over the, the traffic, yeah? Uh, not that simple. Uh, now for India, we see the opportunities and challenges uh, which are existing uh, in various areas. Um, from the manufacturing to the launch operations and services. Um, if you are interested in the slides, come to me. I, I am willing to share that, of course, with you. Um, yes, so that's for the moment. And uh, happy now to go into further discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Uh, no, I think we'll, uh, now I have to play the role of moderator. I have a few listed down questions. Of course, some of them are partially addressed. Maybe we will try to uh, figure out whether we can uh, get into more, little bit in depth into that to throw some light on that. Uh, I will go three rounds and afterwards I'll come to the audience for questions. Uh, with that, we'll conclude that. I, I think we'll be able to uh, close by uh, within the assigned time. Uh, my uh, question is to Mr. Vivek, a simple question. Uh, now we see that uh, the aspirations, uh, as it is my device, handled device, I should be able to use it, whether it is a terrestrial or satellite, that is the uh, ambition of the direct -to device. Though direct -to device is not new, but the way it is projected or perceived in the future, it is uh, se seamless, it is a customer-centric, customer should not feel that. Uh, what is the most uh, difficult technological challenge you feel as a designer? Uh, I, I think the, the challenge comes from multiple factors. One is basically, uh, since we come from the chipset background, we don't consider chipset as challenge per se. That's, that's the, probably the easiest part of it. But if you see the, in the mobile space, the refresh cycles are, are very, very fast. Uh, on an average, every every mobile manufacturer OEM uh, you know launches at least five phones a year, five to six phones a year. Now there are some who are launching more, so you are pretty much having uh, two phones uh, you know uh, every two or three months. Uh, with that kind of a launch cycle, it is very difficult for you to interject the trajectory and and uh, do that. So basically, there is a business model around that. Now the second one is the if you talk to any of the uh, mobile manufacturers when we were doing this. S band, we also were looking at how do we commercialize this beyond the strategic and uh, defense. So, one of the challenges they said was since there is no ask from the end user, like what you rightly said, the the sensitivity to pricing is very, very high. So uh, today, if you know phone manufacturers, even blinks an eye to incorporate, say, Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth or all of those. But the moment you say NFC, for example, uh, or infrared, for example, then they might say whether this is required, not required kind of a stuff. So this actually falls in, in that, that domain. The third one is basically the, uh, the phone manufacturers amortize their costs over several millions or hundreds of millions of devices. Now, if you don't have a, a market which can absorb that kind of devices, then you're talking of say a million, two million, which doesn't justify the investments that, that go, in, go into it. So today, if you see the, the spectrum that is available, for example, now, uh, you know, ISRO has S-band spectrum, but if I have to have L-band, then I need to have a commercial uh, operator who is already having the landing rights here. Now, so what, what device do I design? Do I design an L-band? Do I design an S-band? Now, if you, 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 uh, you 
you basically design an L band, then it it basically becomes a different ball game in terms of the business model. So essentially, I think uh, if we have a universal uh, you know spectrum allocated for mobile phones from uh, from satellite, that would be a killer because then you design a phone which is based on these NTN standards, and then globally you have the same uh, same frequency band where you could uh, potentially operate that, and then I think all the OEMs would uh, uh, you know would be more than happy to in in include in that. Thank you. My next question is to Mr. Satya. Uh, I perceive so far we have seen in the entire communication. Uh, uh, segments. We mainly see three players. One is the mobile manufacturers with chipsets and algorithms. Second one is the service providers and now the third one. We had the competitors in the three isolated domains. Now with this technology onset, I think the competition will become even between <laughs> this, uh, the, the, the line probably will eliminate and like uh, mobile phone and the camera industry, uh, l like that. Now, camera industry ultimately had to face and uh, mobile probably took over that. Uh, do you feel any kind of uh, uh, polarization in this domain? Who could uh, lead from your perspective? Got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, uh, Vivek, we are very happy to standardize on L-band. <laughs> Since we have L-band globally. <laughs> exactly. But so, um, but... I think uh, so. The, the, I, I would look at the question slightly differently. Okay, when we say direct to device, obviously the move by Apple and Global Star with the iPhone has taken the market. You know, people have become very attracted to it. But I think that is only a sliver of the market. The consumer application is only a part of direct to device. When we talk about numbers, whether it's 30 billion, 60 billion, or 400 billion, I think there's much more than the consumer device at play. And that, that's some of the applications I was talking about where you're, talk, where you're looking at or even Vivek was talking about. That is tracking applications, control applications, analytics. There are a lot more B2B uses. And from my, our perspective, the B2B market is actually equally big, if not bigger, right? The B2C market obviously has caught the attention, but the B2B market is big. Now, if you look at it in each ecosystem, in each part of it, different players are required. If you're talking about tracking... Uh, you know, something that is on the high seas or whether it's a fishing boat or, you know, there are interesting applications where, you know, India has become a big seafood exporter and we export seafood, you put it into a cold chain and you got to track the cold chain all the way across the oceans, right? That is exclusively something that is not going to go across a mobile network because it's port to port, right? And once it goes past the port, of course, it'll go on a, on a mobile network. So I think there are, I wouldn't call it necessarily a competition for in every market, there'll be a different set of competition, is my view. I think from a B2B perspective, which is a much, much as big a market, if not bigger, than B2C, there'll be an interesting set of competition there, which is versus what will happen in the consumer segment. So, uh, because in the B2B market, you don't need, a, you know, an Android phone or an iPhone. You're not dealing with phones here. You're now dealing with sensors and hubs and tracking and devices that are tracking and sending information back. So, I think there'll be a different ecosystem there. But ultimately... To Vivek's point, because you need the volume, you need the standardization helps, and when you get the volume, then it's a question of who is able to approach the market and what what services people are looking to buy. Today, if you look at it, we have a lot of services based on IoT on the L-band, right? We we do a lot of work. We do a lot of safety work through our Inmarsat uh, L-band network uh, with ships, with uh, with all sorts of uh, mobile uh, platforms. And therefore, those are interesting applications that are also open from a D2D perspective uh, when you can get other devices which could benefit from those costs being lowered because of the larger ecosystem. Thank you. Uh, my question to uh, Mr. Alexander is, I pick up from your slide, you had put a slide where the licensed band, the satellite band and the unlicensed band. Uh, one is uh, the, it is believed that so far, uh, even my, based on my experience, L-band and S-band were the ideal spectrum bands for IoT kind of things, so mainly because it has a very wider beam width. You don't need the directionality. But with this kind of uh, 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 the uh, technological advancements of direct-to-device, it is uh, uh, believed that 
we should get the uh, broadband directly to the device, not that thin data application. If that being the case, the demand for spectrum goes up very high, uh, then what is your perspective other than L band and S band, what could be the uh, most uh, uh, okay. obvious choice? Yes. So the, 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 the prospect is that um, uh, w we see at the moment that in principle the, the satellite industry is at an infliction point because we having now a few startups which don't have, let's say, that, that money to, to get big into acquiring spectrum in providing the terminals. No, what they believe is we are taking the spectrum which is already in use of the mobile operators. We are giving the mobile operators a chance to earn more revenue with the same spectrum already paid. Um, same time, of course, interference is an issue, uh, gateways, traffic routing, and so on. However, um, it's very tempting having spectrum which is available and having all these millions of mobile devices. And uh, that is something where we see is creating a dynamic. Uh, if it is sustainable, that's another question, because again, if you really want to have um, voice over this spectrum of MNOs, uh, you would have to build also a network which is consistently there. That means also hundreds and thousands of satellites. And to do so, that needs massive, massive, massive investments. Yeah? Um, for messaging service or even for a, a, a voice note that maybe reaches only half an hour later, that is a possibility. But now for broadband, real-time data services, uh, that's a very long way. But yeah, uh, um, the mobile network operators, they have spectrum. And I believe that in the future, we will also see on E-Band uh, uh, certain initiatives coming up um, to complement that. Um, maybe one more note, uh, because uh, 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 it, it's wonderful now on the panel setup, yeah? because we're having people working on the SDRs, working on the chipset. This is really now, uh, in principle, um, a concern for the people coming from the Visa domain. Because on the Visa domain, we are also starting already to talk about what is the universal service device in future. Will these companies, be it Gilad, be it HNS, be it Viasat, also one of the big Visa modem, do they provide their own modem hardware or do we have a universal service box and these companies only providing waveforms? We will see, yeah? But if we talk about waveforms, we see now the risk because there's not that many waveforms if you talk about GS, uh, 5G, 4G, yeah? Everyone is following one standard. But what means everyone? It's only a few big, 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 big players. And I think coming back to why this MNO uh, uh, activities is so interesting for startups is because they have a chance to use Spectrum, which is already there. Apple is using another way. Uh, Huawei is also going another way. You are going another way. Um, we will see. We will look. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, uh, now I'll uh, on co question for uh, Mr. Vivek. Now with this uh, space uh, reforms in India, we see many startups are looking for a way to focus on all those things. What is your suggestion in this domain for the startups to work on? Yes, yeah, so the space reforms actually gave a gave a platform, uh, a framework, basically where you you had spelled out a very clear cut policy on uh, what India is today and where it wants to go. Uh, 
so in 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 that sense it is kind of the canvas is quite large and uh, each one of the companies which are planning to you know either start or have started in this one there are a lot of opportunities like one of the stuff that he mentioned alexander mentioned was about vsat now we don't have an indigenous vsat equipment in india we have flown so many high throughput satellites but we don't have an indigenous vsat equipment now that that itself is an opportunity he spoke about their biggest businesses been iot's now uh, iot it gives an enormous amount of uh, opportunity because of the analytics that he mentioned one is capturing the data from the sensors but the back end what you do uh, just a four five people company can do wonders in 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 that business because the data and the intelligence that you, the data can bring in in some of the decision makings for example weather forecasting or beat insurance and all of that those can completely be a game changer now in in terms of the hardware if i were to look at it the hardware market is pretty nascent in india uh, we have had challenges in terms of the maturity of the ecosystem but with all this emphasis being given by the central government on on atmanirbharta make in india and all of those the we have started seeing a lot of maturity in, uh, also coming up on the ems a, ems part of it now finally the the other thing that probably we might want to look at is basically uh, if you, if you see today the uh, Uh, the all the set of companies that are there in the big companies uh, you know be it in us or in in europe uh, they have been handled by nasa and esa with huge amount of grants now uh, india somehow has not had that luxury yet so we are pretty much on our own to go find of course there will be techno technological support from from uh, the likes of isro uh, but to eventually scale like for example uh, you know he was mentioning about the spent expenditure that was required uh, apple spent half a billion dollars in in just repurposing the satellites for their uh, just a sos messaging service now uh, how many companies can actually afford to do that to have that kind of a service they had the meat they had the numbers they had the Uh, whole supply chain in their game but still yet it took them so much uh, you know investments and also they deferred meaning it it was in the works for almost 4 uh, years that program before they could actually launch a device so it's a very capital intensive per se but the device ecosystem uh, is is enormous because almost 37% of the global economy is on the ground communication equipment and and device uh, ecosystem and with all these high throughput satellites and all these you know uh, basically the IoT the applications coming in uh, it's getting going to get bigger and bigger and eventually you will see uh, basically a kind of a seamless integration between once that ntn uh, uh, ntn release 18 happens uh, you will have a seamless uh, integration between the telco and and uh, satcom world but we are in, in release 17 so you are gradually started seeing that but eventually you will have that so if you start investing now uh in, in in as a as a startup company then the uh, opportunities are on the rise and uh, i'm sure there is enough uh, the pie is large enough for each of us to you know uh, survive and grow thank you thank you uh my next question to mr satya is uh, in this uh, uh, direct to device uh, the communications do you feel there is any barrier Uh, in be this becoming an operational service if so do you feel any threat to the gso systems so um as a service provider ourselves using satellite based um services uh we think you know the the barriers in this are no different from the barriers in many other services we've launched right it really comes down to having the different parts of the ecosystem work that is number one technology side but also second side is making sure there is enough business value for every player right any one player who has a significant part who's not capturing value will also be a problem and the third is regulation right government also has a huge part to play in it because now we are talking about devices which could be often um if not in the consumer handset but in the iot side could be moving uh you know across national boundaries in some cases right or across the globe so i think all three of these have to come together for it to work and from a uh, a geo i mean so your point about gso no i don't i don't think so i think um i think ultimately it comes down to who is going to deliver the best bandwidth economics and 
Um, you know, time and again, uh, in many cases, what has been shown is, you know, from the simplest data point that says 95% of the Earth's population lives on 10% of the land, okay? From that simple density issue to the fact that, you know, in many, many cases, when we even talk about high seas or trains or planes, they are not flying randomly. They are not sailing randomly. They are on determined paths. Just like railway tracks, in the, in the air we have highways, in the ocean we have uh, seaways, right? So all of these are places where you need to concentrate bandwidth. And from our perspective, nothing concentrates bandwidth unless, you know, like geostationary satellites can, right? So that is the other part of it. But I also wanted to address this, um, this question about VSAT vendors, if I may, to add to that, okay? So um, first off, we are a satellite service operator. We're not a VSAT vendor, but... I think if, even if I were a VSAT vendor, I wouldn't be too worried about this ecosystem because this is only one slice of the pie. There's a huge other ecosystem out there that the satellite runs, right? We're not going to be, I mean, it runs planes, it's on trains, it's on, uh, you know, ships, it's on fixed broadband, it's providing Wi-Fi backhaul, it's providing mobile backhaul. There are a lot of other opportunities, I think, for the VSAT operators. So if I were Gilart and iDirect, I wouldn't lose sleep. I would continue to innovate and I think that 5G NTN or NB-IoT or direct device, all of these are increasing the size of the market, which will help the ecosystem, not necessarily displacing some of the markets. Thank you. I think you have put it very nicely. Uh, now my question to Mr. Alexander is, in your uh, slides you summarized that before actually the uh, device, direct-to-device service comes into operational mode, there are specific challenges it needs to be addressed, uh, you, you brought out in your uh, s slide. Considering all those things and uh, taking from the point that you said some 400 plus billions of economic value in the next 10 years, uh, taking this cue, when can we expect the direct-to-device service to come into operation? <laughs> yes. Um it depends a little bit uh, how successful the VSAT operators, today's service operators, satellite operators progress with their deployment, also of geo high throughput, ultra high throughput. And yes, nowadays uh, Viasat is maybe not a VSAT modem manufacturer. However, looking back in history, I think uh, Viasat made a wise decision to build, in principle, their own satellites which are utilizing modems which are also produced by Viasat. And for h &S, it's exactly the same. Yeah? That's why they are building these massive satellites from Ecostar, yeah? uh, because the, the market, if you don't surf it on your own, it's getting too small. And uh, with people like uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk who are providing a full value chain of uh, launch to modem to delivery over the internet, taking out even the middleman, um, they having a different understanding of what's the business case for them. They don't need to make, or at least Amazon, they don't need to make money with the connectivity they will make money simply by connecting people to their additional services. And I think that's what we see, what all the satellite operators will try to do, to bring in value beside the pure connectivity. Now, where the mobile network operators are very strong is in principle, they are having this connectivity to the end customers. They know how to do the billing. They know how to do the whole administration. And that is something um, I think, uh, yes, big companies like Viasat can also do that in their segment, but for smaller entrants, it will be more and more difficult in that visa domain, yeah? And now coming back to uh, 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 billing uh, uh, um, for a mobile operator, this is an essential thing, yeah, in the, the smaller, let's say startups uh, aiming to get funding for their constellation, they have to focus in principle on the space segment. They cannot do each and everything. Um, and that's why they see for the help 
of all these mobile network operators. And these mobile network operators are huge. These are big, big, big companies. Yeah. Um, at the same time, the overall utilization of satellite um, capacity and services in the telecom sector is without the evolution of D2D around 1.5 to 2 percent and in future it may be 3 percent to 3.5 percent. So we are still talking about something rather small. And now you see that in this segment companies like Deutsche Telekom and SpaceX starting to utilize their technology. Yes, of course, uh, 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 here we see also uh, Iridium or Inmarsat. They are playing a role and they will play a role. I, I, I strongly believe in that. But the number of players may go much smaller. And uh, on the operational side, I think uh, uh, if you are going with the traditional L-band, S-band, uh, MSS, this is a rather safe play. Uh, of course, also there we have interference, we're having the limitations of the spectrum, we know about that. Uh, but uh, what is happening now with the mobile network operators uh, spectrum um, towards the LEO satellites, but also what comes below LEO, that was a discussion also in the morning. We will have uh, higher altitude platforms coming in. They, they, they may provide service. Um, again, I, I, I think there is uh, um, definitely this need for multi-orbit operations and uh, it starts even below LEO. Yeah? Uh, maybe high altitude platforms can be linked again to the LEO satellites or the MEO satellites. Uh, and uh, making the best out of the spectrum which is there. Yeah? That, 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 that we will see, yeah? regardless if it is from the satellite operator's perspective or for the mobile network operators, they meant to make the most money out of that spectrum. And the people building the handsets, they want to make sure you are buying another handset in a year ago. And ago. So that's the same with the TV sets, that's why I'm going for 4K, 6K, 8K and even higher. Thank you. Uh, we have come to the almost uh, close to the time allotted to us. Uh, anyway, I think we'll go for three questions from the audience. Uh, can you hand over a mic there? Two quick questions. One on uh, licensing. Uh, D2C has advertised it's the ultimate bypass solution. Uh, I'm not sure even in Marsat's GMPCS license would allow you to do it in India today. What's the sense of the panel on this being authorized in India? And for uh, Vivek on VMS, uh, is 3,000 fishing vessels the ultimate objective or what's the roadmap beyond that? Coming to the licensing part, every license, in fact, as the survey, uh, technologies improve, they provide a solution to some of the existing problem. For example, the uh, Inmarsat connectivity was uh, still now was uh, pursued as addressing some particular solution of portable or mobile communication. Now, the directed device, once it becomes an operational, because the here, uh, the targeted connectivity will be to reach the unreached. In that case, the license uh, uncovered areas and uh, the people, who, uh, th that's how it is pro projected. When that is the thing come, that becomes the solution, of course, the enabling provisions, licensing provisions will be there, subject to certain security considerations. That's second one. Uh, second question was your uh, fishing vessel uh, tracking. Uh, uh, can you repeat the question, sir? Mostly Vivek will. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. So, yeah, the first pro uh, first uh, state that was chosen was basically Tamil Nadu. So, uh, the the first set of boats which were chosen were mechanized boats. So, this is currently installed on that. Now, there is a plan to scale this to Pan India. As you all know, there is like 7,500 kilometer. Uh, coastline, one of the biggest in the world, and then uh, we have about uh, 
all boats put together, which are like 200,000 plus boats, but there is already an RFP for 100,000 uh, fishing vessels by uh, by NSIL, which is uh, ISRO entity. So the scaling is very much on the cards for that one. So it will be both for, for the uh, fishermen safety as well as uh, basically monitoring your uh, shore. Thank you. Hello. Uh, uh, as the uh, new services are coming based on big data, big data analytics, robotics. Uh, my name is Dr. Anu Shivasto. I was uh, with MTNL as executive director. Uh, uh, so all these services which are coming up based on big data, analytics, robotics, which need a lot of large bandwidth. Also, they need a large number of device connectivity and good latency and all, all these requires. How do you cope with all these uh, uh, satellite-based services on a larger scale with the, with the spectrum availability and all those? So, uh, I think uh, Alexander made the point about it. It's, it's a multi-orbit world, right? So, clearly, and it's a multi-band world. It's multi-orbit, multi-band, which means there are certain s spectrum allocated for satellite like L-band or S-band, etc., where you are using it for certain purposes. There's certain other spectrum like the K-band spectrum, 28 gigahertz, KU-band spectrum, etc., where you have KU band, you have a lot more than LNS. K, you have a lot more than LNS. So it's all about finding the band that makes sense, right? Not everything needs to also at the same time uh, be run through the same type of device. For example, if you're in a mine and you have a fixed set of sensors, you may not worry as much about the size of the device because it's actually fixed, right? You would have a hub solution. The hub could connect to satellite over a traditional satellite solution also, right? There might be other cases where you have mobile solutions, where you have somebody who's walking around with the handheld, who therefore has to have connectivity. So you could pick different bands. You could go KA with a fixed set of sensors, get much higher throughput. So again, it's a question of how do you architect the solution for it, and no one band or no one orbit or no one solution is going to fit all. So you need the operators or somebody who's on the ground, like a system integrator, who's bringing all of these together. That's my view. All these requirements are the bandwidth reliability or flexibility or the latency part and also the number of the connectivity connected. How do you compare the cost-wise, uh, the number of the satellites to be put for these services and the laying of the optical fiber? How do you compare the cost-wise? That, that, that uh, I don't know if Mr. Raipa has enough time in the session to answer that question, but maybe we can have a chat offline, sir, after it. Yeah, that, that we get, he's the right person to answer on commercials. Yeah, that will make a whole lot of uh, Hello, uh, I'm Dev Lina. I... Um, represent Numerate, CEO and founder Numerate. We're a startup. We work with fishing communities. So my question is directed to Vivek. Uh, so uh, I'm curious about a lot of things, especially on the adoption of the device, because fishing communities are inherently a very difficult community to really cater to. So when it comes to tracking, how their you know, uh, reaction to the tracking is my question, but I'll park it for offline discussion. But uh, uh, your tie up with ISRO uh, for the you know 200,000 vessels that you're looking to scale up, is it just with ISRO or you're open to integrating with private uh, companies on data and uh, voice providers? Yeah, so that's an important uh, important thing that you highlighted. Uh, initially, uh, tracking inspection is not a very favorable word when it comes to India, you know. Uh, people get a little worried when you say that. So we initially used to call it uh, you know, we have coined our, uh, the, the terminal as Navdut, so it basically helps you to navigate in the sea. But uh, after this experience that we had with the fishermen, uh, we changed it to Nabamitra. So it is a friend in the sky. So it's just the messaging, how you do the, the technology, the purpose remains the same, it's just how do you do messaging. Now, with regards to your second question, I think the, the objective of doing uh, this, this whole network end-to-end, -end, uh, it is too much of an ask for a, for a 
company which started as a chipset company to uh, you know kind of deploy and maintain a network it's too much of an ask with a handful of companies in the world which do that why it is in fact one of them but for us the whole idea was that can we replicate this globally and like uh, sir said l and s band are the two most favorite bands when it comes to these portable terminals handheld terminals and all and for narrow band i think that's the best po possible solutions uh, as on today so we will definitely take this to other bands as well go global with this one as far as the data is concerned currently since it is it is a project which is commissioned by government of india they have the whole right on the on the data but i am sure anything which is useful to the fishermen there is something called as a preferred fishing zone potential fishing zone so uh, that is coming from again a government of india entity the yes. fisherman gets access to that data so it's also improving his livelihood and also we are in the back end we are tagging this with the e-commerce platform uh, so that uh, you know he can he, whatever catch he has had he could potentially square it off before even uh, he he reaches the shore this is partially because the uh, as you know there is a lot of wastage almost 30% of there is a wastage because not adequate cold storage and the time it ta uh, takes for him to come to the shore if he knows the catch if he can send a picture and uh, the the owner can just square it off so there are some some collateral benefits that we are deriving out of it but yeah as far as data is concerned uh, we we are not the custodian of the data thank, thank you, you. I think uh, we have exceeded 10 minutes. We'll wind up the session so that we'll break for coffee. Over to you. Thank you. And I, my sincere thanks to all the panelists for uh, uh, throwing light on very relevant uh, uh, points. On the yes, very well said. That was a very informative session. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Chair. And now, please, you can head for the cheese. Next session would happen in the oval. That's common for all. No parallel sessions. Thank you so much. <laughs>